I don't see any other people in the waiting room for now, so let's begin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gurudash, can you mute? Uh, it's done, sir. Everybody accept the yeah. tone because we don't want disturbance uh, coming in. Yes, sir. It's already done. Right. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's library talk. Shumit Ray will be in conversation with Shabuni Basu, who is a journalist and Sunday Times bestselling author. Her books include the critically acclaimed Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer, Arthur Conan Doyle, George Edelgy, and the Case of the Foreigner in the English Village. And this is the book about which she will be talking tonight. The Times has reviewed it and said that the book is almost as good as the Sherlock Holmes books. Her other books are For King and Another Country, Indian Soldiers on the Western Front, 1914 to 18, Victoria and Abdul, The True Story of the Queen's Closest Confidant, which is now a major motion picture, Spy Princess, The Life of Noor Inayat Khan, and finally, Curry, The Story of the Nation's Favorite Dish. She was born in Calcutta and grew up in Dhaka, Kathmandu, and Delhi, graduated in history from Stephen's College, Delhi, and completed her master's from Delhi University. She has always combined her journalism with her love of history, and all her books have evolved from her observations about the shared histories of India and Britain. She is a frequent commentator on Indian history and empire on British television and radio, and has appeared in several documentaries on BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, and other British channels. You all know my uh, colleague Sumit Ray well. Um, he's joining us today from Addis Ababa. Shravani is appearing from London. Many of us are in India, so this is a three-continent event. As with all other talks, there will be a question and answer session afterwards, for which please uh, do keep typing in your questions in the, ch in the chat box during the course of the talk, and I'll ask some of them um, at the end of the conversation between Sh Shravani and Sh Shumit. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sharujesh, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for logging in today, which promises to be a very, very interesting evening. Uh, Shrabani, welcome, and uh, is it good afternoon or good morning? Good afternoon, I think. It's afternoon, just yes, past lunch. good afternoon in London, <laughs> and really, it's an honor and pleasure to be in conversation with you. We've been in it earlier, and it's really my pleasure to be talking to you today. So in addition to what I think Shaurajesh has said, uh, as people know that Shrabani is a scholar, historian, a journalist, an author, forthright and honest. And Shrabani, I think uh, we have run through the list of the books that you have done, barring curry, the story of the nation's favorite dish, if I were to go back to your mm. earlier books, mm -hmm. which is uh, about the soldiers uh, in the World War I, the Indian soldiers on the Western Front, whether it was about Abdul Karim, which is in Victoria and Abdul, or in Ayat uh, Noor Khan, and of course, George Adalji, which we're going to be discussing today, you seem to have a love of picking up these very, very underdogs who have really uh, done something. And therefore, my first question to you is, <laughs> what drives you to these stories? And why do you uh, run after these kind of research-based stories? What is the driving force behind picking up these underdogs and making them heroes and heroines in your book? Well, I think the first thing is because I'm a journalist. And I'm a very curious journalist. Uh, and, um, you know, as we said earlier, I, I have a love for history. So all my books are, you know, pre-1947. <laughs> so I, I sort of like to combine my journalism. I like to find stories. As a journalist, you're always looking for different stories. And for me, many of these books have come out of things that I have written, may have written an article about and felt that, you know, this needs to be explored more. Uh, some have come through researching something else. So many of them have been driven by my journalism. And then, you know, I have obviously an article for a newspaper is, you know, 1,000 words, 1,200 words. Here you have to do that much intense research and it's a 100,000 word book, uh, which takes me about four years, five years sometimes. This one took five years. Uh, but I love these stories of these unknown people who've slipped through history. You know, they are now a footmark in history, unknown completely, but they've played crucial roles at certain periods. So take Noor Inayat Khan, she was a secret agent in the Second World War. She was awarded the George Cross. She was killed, the only Indian killed in a concentration camp in Dachau. You know, so it's such, a, it's such a brutal story. It's such an inspiring story as well because she went down screaming liberty 
And it's a story that was completely forgotten. And I felt I had to tell her story to the world. I had not heard of her. I grew up in India. I was 25 when I came to London. So I had not heard of her in India. And I you know, happened to chance on her in London. And I felt I must tell this story. Uh, so Noor's, I was drawn as a woman. And also because I've always in, been interested in following the stories of the contribution of Indian soldiers to both Second World War and the First World War. Because again, that's a whole story that's been erased. You know, nobody was aware. Uh, I felt I had to do, do that bit. Uh, Abdul Karim, of course, was a you know, delightful story. Did you hear about Abdul Karim and George Idalji when you were in India, like Noor? No, Did you of not. hear about them when you went to England? Absolutely, all of them here. Because like I said, they're forgotten characters. Nobody knew them. I went to Agra, where Abdul Karim is from, and nobody knew him in Agra. So you can imagine how, you know, his story was so erased. I had to search for his grave. Nobody knew. Even his family didn't know where he was buried. It was that much of a distance. So it's, it takes years, but once I start digging, then, you know, I just have to go on digging. digging. And therefore, Shrabani, the next question is, how do you go about digging and how long does it take? Because this is obviously a lot of research based and there is an element as I can see through reading your book and especially the one that I'm currently just finished, uh, the one we're going to discuss today. Uh, there is a lot of fact which you research and that mm -hmm. takes time. There is also a lot of description of the character and there is a certain amount of the imagination as an author that you bring into mm -hmm. the character because these are known people. We don't know how they looked, how they spoke. Mm -hmm. So how much of it is fact and how much of it is your imagination when you built the story? Um, it's actually 100% fact. So when you say, I don't know how they look, I do know because they are real people. And, you know, I'm looking at all their images and I, I contact the families with Noor. I was speaking to her brothers. I was speaking to her friends. So I am recreating her. And it's, you know, hearing about her. How did she speak? I asked her friend, you know, what sort of accent did she have? What did she look like? How did she sing? I spoke to her brothers. I have the photographs. So for me, you know, just bringing out what Noor looked like, what she sounded like, what sort of person she was, was easy because of all the interviews I did around her character. And uh, with Abdul Karim, there are write-ups about him. You know, there are descriptions about him in the press, the UK press. So it's easy. To, and of course, there are so many photographs. So I can see all that. I can see how Victoria describes him it's quite easy to then really enter, then go into their writings, their diaries, and you can reconstruct what they were like, what their they personalities, sure. uh, what they look like is there for you to see. And, um, and the same, I pre know. presume, was applicable for George Idalji as well. So oh, yes, you had a lot yes. of the other facts. Absolutely. The only, the only thing with George is there, uh, you know, the family line ended, so I could not speak to his descendants, which I have done with all my other books. Uh, okay. But uh, George had no children, so that family Just life. another last question before we get into the book, and I'm sure my audience are waiting to know more about the mystery of the Parsi lawyer. We are mm -hmm. very proud of the fact that you are perhaps one of the rare Bengali authors whose film was made into a Hollywood film, oh. Victoria and Abdul. So before we get into the mystery of the Parsi lawyer, would you like to share with our viewers today what has been the experience when your novel was selected to be made into a Hollywood film and to have experienced uh, Judy Jen, uh, Judy Dench and uh, uh, Fazal, well, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, what Ali was Fazal. it like? Yes, Ali it Fazal was, and... It was fabulous. I mean, a, a, actually, Shumit, it wasn't a novel. Remember, I write history. So very few nonfiction books are actually taken and adapted on that scale. Uh, but uh, mine was. I was lucky. It was a fantastic team. I couldn't ask for more. You know, it was not a small production with tacky costumes. I, I would not even have given the option. It was working title. It was Universal Studios. It was Stephen Frears. You know, he did The Queen. He did uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, you know, Oscar winning director. Um, and of course, you know, the prize. <laughs> it was Judy Dench as Queen Victoria. Um, when they said we're going to do the film, all I kept saying is because the casting happens later, you know, the optioning happens first, casting later. And so when they optioned it, I said, oh, please, you know, who, who do you have in mind for Victoria? Because, you know, I can see only Judy Dench in this role. And they said, yes, we have her in mind. She has to say yes. Uh, luckily, she said yes. And that day I was like jumping up and down in my study <laughs> when the news came through that, yes, <laughs> she's on. Um, and how, as an author, how far would you say was it, did it follow the book in terms of the screenplay and things? And how involved were you in the development of that? 
I was a consultant on the film, so I was very involved. I was going, you know, meeting them for the scripts, for the director, for everything, for costumes. You know, they wanted to know what should you wear. So I had all these photographs and I said, the first introduction has to be in these red, you know, they wear this red livery with VRI written. So we decided that would be the first scene. It was beautiful. Um, of course, a film is a film. You've got 90 minutes in which to tell a story which I have written in 100,000 words. It's not easy. And you have to fictionalize. You have to create dialogue. So there is an element of fiction. There is a few little elements of drama that they'll introduce here and there. But by and large, 80% of, of it was actually based on my book. There are such dramatic moments. Nobody could believe it. You know, when we had the, uh, these premieres in Venice and Toronto, the journalists would ask, you know, did they really burn the letters? And he said, yes. <laughs> did she really, did they really try to say that, you know, you are insane? And I said, yes, <laughs> all this actually happened, you know, because it's all recorded. And I, you know, it's what I brought out in the book. And you just need Judy Dench to say those lines, you know, it's just fantastic. Even the mango story, for those of yes. you who've seen it, <laughs> is true, yes. it happens. <laughs> and I told the screenplay writer, that's my favorite because, you know, we Favorite eat part. mangoes here in London now before they eat them in Bombay because they're all exported. <laughs> and I said, poor Victoria never got a mango. mango. <laughs> she never got an Alfonso mango. Um, and from so, the empire that she reigned. Yes, anyway, so, congratulations once again, Shabani. It's really, really proud. And all of us from Bengal Club really, really take great pride to know that. And we do hope maybe this book too shall become a film. So let's now move to the mystery of the okay. Parsi lawyer. And I think that... Will you will permit me to... Make Sorry, to just hold up the book so people can see yeah. the cover in sure, case sure. I haven't seen it. So that's it, because it hasn't reached your shops yet, or it is just reaching. It is. Yeah. It has reached it Crossword, is. and it's available on Amazon, I saw. Right. Yeah. Uh, so really, uh, the byline, uh, Shabuni, reads very well. Arthur Conan Doyle, George Idalji, and the case of the foreigner in the, in the English village. Now, all of us have grown up with Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle. So tell us, tell us a little bit about this mysterious Parsi lawyer. <laughs> right. So who is the Parsi lawyer? Well, he is a he's a 28 year old lawyer called George Adalji, and uh, his father uh, Shapurji was the vicar. Shapurji Adalji had come from Bombay, uh, converted. He was a Parsi, converted to Christianity, moved to England, and wanted to train as a priest. And he became uh, the the vicar of this church in a small village in England. Uh, so, so he's the vicar of Great Worley, which is a small mining village in the Midlands near Staffordshire. And you have some images, uh, Shumit, if you'd like to share them. Let's yes, bring Rudash, the if you can just, yeah, just share the PPT so that people can see and they get a feel of what Trabuni is um, going to describe. So the, you know, I think first we'll bring up an image of the vicarage. Yeah, the second one, yeah. Okay. So this is the vicarage. This is where they lived. And the next image, please, thanks. So this is the family. So you can see Shapurji. He looks very Parsi. He's the one in the big coat. That's Now, he married a white woman. So she's English. Her name is Charlotte. And uh, she was also the daughter of a vicar. So it's very much church circles. And next to her, you know, standing there is George. He's probably about... On the extreme left. Yeah, extreme left is George with a little hat. Seated next to him is a sister, uh, Maud, Maud, and uh, the other brother is Horace. So this is the family. This is taken in 1892 outside the vicarage. And um, even at this time in the vicarage, what has happened is for the first time, as I said, Shapurji is the first South Asian vicar in England. And this is 1876. So you can imagine it's the height of empire. Victoria very much on her throne. And um, he comes to this white parish. He is preaching to a completely white parish. So it's trouble from day one. Because um, by the time George is 12, uh, there's hate mail coming through, poison pen letters. There's racist graffiti. There's, uh, you know, stuff being deposited, excreta, this, that, things littered all over. So the hate against this family is evident there right from the start. But uh, let's get the next image of George. This is what George is as a young adult. So you can see he, George himself is a very, uh, he's a very shy, very awkward, very studious uh, young boy. He then after his schooling, he goes to, he becomes 
becomes a, a, a solicitor. So he joins a firm in Birmingham. But he's like a good Indian boy. He lives with his parents. He lives in the vicarage. He catches the 845 train and he goes to Birmingham. He has no life. He has no friends. He doesn't go to the pub. He doesn't drink. He, is, um, he comes back a very by good train. Boy. <laughs> a bit, bit too good. But also a loner, you see. An awkward loner. A dark-skinned awkward loner. And to top it all, um, he had these bulgy eyes because he's very myopic. So his whole frame, as you even saw in the you know, the previous photo, you can see that he was, um, his eyes are slightly bulgy. So all that makes a little bit of a, you know, somebody they sort of suspicious of, and he is the target of all these letters, all these anonymous hate letters. Um, 1895, there are letters his father is receiving saying, we're going to send George to his grave, you know, everything, all the hate is directed at this poor boy. Well, when he's an adult, this is when he is in Birmingham, in 1903, this is where the story shifts. Uh, we could take the uh, screen away now. I'll yeah, come so back before, to more. Yeah, yeah, before you come to the 1903, a uh, couple of quick questions. I mean, so therefore mm -hmm. it is very clear that though Shapuji had converted to Christianity, uh, which he did in India, if, I, if I'm right, and he converted, yeah. and I'm sure that was not very well taken by the Parsi community because they were really the ones who had converted and went. So having mm -hmm. done that, he lost ground in his own country. And when he goes to the country where he wants to practice Christianity as a vicar, yeah. there's a lot of racism and hatred against that, which is so ironical because even in 2021, Shabuni, we are hearing Harry and <laughs> Meghan talk about the color of Archie's uh, skin. Exactly. So exactly. Largely, so, so when this I, is based yeah. on racism. And if you would like to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is, as I said, all this, these racist attacks are happening on this family. And, you know, when I was going through, sitting in the archives and reading these hateful letters saying, we're going to kill you, you know, you brown man, you um, all sorts. I mean, you can imagine the language that is used. And um, I was just thinking, my goodness, you know, this happened 100 years ago, but it is still so relevant now. We are talking about the skin color of, you know, it's, it's from the royal household to the person on the street, you know. Who is this? This is still prevalent. This is happening even today in not just UK, it's happening everywhere. I mean, you know, prejudice against foreigners, um, prejudice against dark people, brown skin people, everything. It's uh, during the pandemic, you know, who was stopped and searched the most? It was all the black people and the Asian people, you know, they're the ones who are stumped. Who is in the jails? You know, 3% of the population of England is, is, is a black population, but 13% of the jail population, blacks. So just to put it in perspective that, you know, so much has, nothing has changed. It is still there. And as for hate mail, it may not be coming through your, it is coming through the door, but also there's trolling, isn't it? There is so much trolling, so much so that, you know, so Harry and Meghan said here. they had to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shrabani, so uh, what drew you to this story and how did you go about researching and getting these facts? So what was really mm -hmm. the genesis of this story? Was it an article or something came up or what happened? Yeah, yeah. Well, I knew, you know, I have a little like a filing cabinet of interesting people that I want to go back to at some time. And, uh, I had George in that cabinet for many, many years. Um, and uh, but then I was also working on my other book, the Victorian Abdul, other things going on, plus my day job. And then um, uh, Julian Barnes, you know, he's a very well, famous novelist. He wrote a piece of fiction called Arthur and George, and he had covered, uh, it is based on the, it's fiction, it's, um, but it's based on the George Adalji case. So then I said, well, Julian Barnes has written it, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do now? So I just parked that and I put it away. And then 2015, we came into, uh, I saw an article saying there are some letters that are coming up for auction and they are to do with, Arthur Conan Doyle and the police chief at the time. And it's Anson. to do with yeah, Anson. His name was George Anson. And Anson. he was a fucker imperialist, hated brown skin Shapurji, hated George. He said niggerish in appearance is how he described him. Awful man and a complete racist. So he, he and the, uh, the exchange between Arthur Conan Doyle and him. So I said, there's new material there. And I went, uh, you know, followed up on those letters. So 2015, I started research. I said, you know, it's a sign. I've always wanted to write about George. Here's new material and I can do the proper story, you know, the actual facts as I like to do. So that's how it started. 
So but, you um, had access to all those letters and you had access to all that. Oh, that was, so okay. That was just the, the new material I found. But there's also, you know, I went to other libraries. I had to, I read the home office files on the case. You have to put it together through many things. I went to Birmingham and, you know, there's files, all his, some of his letters are in Birmingham. So between several archives, I pieced together the story. And of course, I went to the vicarage. <laughs> you know, Which is interesting the... because journalists later in years will have no access to such letters because we've stopped writing letters. With emails and WhatsApp and messages, I wonder how journalist authors like you 20 years from now will be able to research. But I coming know. back, to you mm -hmm. said that there were a lot of racist slur when Shapuji went and tried to practice to the uh -huh. parish. So uh -huh. did his other fellow vicars and the Christian population and all, were they supporting? Because obviously there was some, some group that was against him and uh -huh. perhaps being uh, supported by the police uh, inspector at that time, Upton and people, with all uh -huh. that hate mail going. And obviously they were going through that trauma. So was there any kind of uh, support that he was getting or was it just building up? It was, you know, sadly, it was just building up. He just went to the police because, you know, this hate mail is coming to him. The police were of absolutely no help. And so they just suffered. The family suffered. And then it stopped for some time, a few years. Suddenly, this, all this hate mail stops. George by then becomes a lawyer. And the police and blame George for writing these hate mail. Police, oh. of course. Yeah, they yeah. keep oh. thinking it's George. He's the mischievous one. He's this odd teenager. He's writing letters. For some reason, they are convinced it's him. And then, then that what chapter, turn happened, which took the case to where it is. Could you share that so then, with the... Yeah. Yep. So 1903 is when this whole thing takes a real sinister turn. Because suddenly this village is gripped by terror. Because someone is coming at night and slashing cattle. They are just mutilating the horses. They are, you know, slashing their stomachs, leaving them to die in the fields. And this goes on. The police are totally ineffective. This goes on for about six months and they can't catch anybody. Villagers are terrified. You can imagine the rumor and the, you know, the speculation. And so where will all this point? Of course, it points, goes back to the only Indian family in this village, and that is the Idalgis. And suspicion falls on the odd looking boy with the bulgy eyes who goes on long country walks. It's George Idalji. So suddenly, Everything suspicion is falling on George Dalji and anonymous letters again they start and they start pointing to George Dalji. So the police sweep in, they a horse is killed just about half a mile from the vicarage. The police swoop in, they arrest him, and um, he is charged with killing horses. He is tried. In 55 minutes, the jury pronounce him guilty, and uh, poor George is taken away. So I have a photo and then Shumit, I'd love you to read some of the reports, you know, just to show how racist the whole thing was at this time. Some of the reports in the local papers of the trial. But first, let's bring up this image of George in police custody. Right. So while we are seeing the image, uh, Shabuni, uh, yeah. so obviously Dalji and Shapuji and George had their lawyers. And a uh, question so that comes is... to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is after his arrest. Uh, just after his arrest. You can see he's like, he looks a sight, poor fellow. <laughs> but, so it's obviously very clear the prejudice that started much earlier with the hate mail and the letter got culminated into victimizing him for the mutilation of the cattle and the horses. Yes. And uh, yeah. just something when I was reading was that, you know, you did mention that he had these bulging eyes and he was myopic and a lot of the killings happened at night. Mm -hmm. So was there never for the defense saying that he couldn't see or it was impossible? I mean, or was it so skewed towards Anson and the racist imperial police force that the poor Adalgis had no case? Yeah, they had no case. He was sentenced before he entered the dock. And this is exactly what. So to just sort of take this forward, he's in jail for, uh, he's given seven years uh, imprisonment, but in three years, he's let out on parole. And but his solicitor's role license has been called, you know, cancelled. He can't practice. He doesn't even want to live in Great Valley anymore because he says, if another horse is killed, I'll be pushed in again. You know, suspicion will fall on me. So he goes to London. And what does he do in London? He writes to Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> and he says, so we'll pause it here, Shabani. Let me quickly read a couple yeah, of those yeah. uh, mails yeah, because yeah. now the entrance of Arthur Conan Doyle makes the story very interesting. The second and part writes, two. Yeah, second yes. part. <laughs> so this is what the Daily Mail reported post the trial. 
Those who closely study this extraordinary criminal in the dock would have no doubt that he is a degenerate of the worst type. His jaw and mouth are those of a man very debased life. Idalji also gained for himself the reputation of being a lover of mystery, another oriental trait, and one that goes far to explain the anonymous letters. Love of mystery rather than bloodlust was, according to the Crown, the predispositive uh, motive. The Birmingham Daily Gazette, reflecting on the extraordinary nature of the crime and the circumstances of the accused, ventured, the explanation of the choice is probably to be found in the circumstance that Idalji is of Eastern extradition. The subtle Eastern mind loves a mystery and is vain. The Eastern mind is satisfied with its secret. The Midland Express concluded, we are glad to think that the district of Great Worley and the country is safe from such a monster for several years to come. So racist and so one-sided. It is completely that. So, in fact, so the first thing that happens when he writes to Arthur Conan Doyle and he says, um, but Help before me. that, would you share with our uh, viewers, why did he write to Arthur Conan Doyle? I mean, what was yeah. the genesis and the background behind that? Yeah. So basically, he is, he's out on parole, but he can't work. So he has no employment because he's been struck off the solicitor's rolls. And uh, he can't return to his village in Great Worley because he's scared. Another cattle might be killed. And um, he just has nothing to do in London. And in prison, he read these novels of Arthur Conan Doyle. He read Hound of Baskerville. Now, this is also the time when Arthur Conan Doyle has actually, he had actually killed off uh, Sherlock Holmes, if you remember. You know, for those who are fans of the Arthur Conan Doyle will know that he killed off Sherlock Holmes because he got so fed up of his hero. And he threw him off Reichenbach Falls and ended that story, but he had to bring him back. So actually, at the turn of the century, when the trouble is starting with George Adalji is the time that Arthur Conan Doyle is actually bringing um, Sherlock Holmes back again. So Hound of the Baskerville is published. Huge hit. It is his biggest seller. And George reads it in prison. You know, again, it's a story in the moors, there's animals. And he just feels that there is one person who can solve this mystery. It's Sherlock Holmes. It's the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle. And he writes to him. I must say he's a pretty plucky, you know, a Parsi who thinks that, you know, let me write to this famous author. And Arthur Conan Doyle sees this letter and he rises. He says, yes, I'll do it. So, you know, remarkable stuff. And then he begins his investigation and the papers are just, Sherlock Holmes is going to investigate the Parsi case. And within hours, you know, once you have this stardust supporting you, you know, it suddenly... <laughs> George Adalji, who is called debased and oriental and evil, is suddenly everyone's favorite <laughs> because, you know, he's got the backing of Arthur Conan Doyle. So, so the question the is, why, did, why do you think Arthur Conan Doyle even agreed to take on the case, considering mm -hmm. that maybe he had taken just one before that, if I'm not mistaken? No, so, no he'd, oh, he'd never, never taken. He'd never no, taken, no. right. He'd and he had taken the Dreyfus uh, affair before that, I think. In France. That's in France. That's yeah. in France. So the so Dreyfus affair. Hmm. In your research, would you would you be able to pick up why did Arthur Conan Doyle take up this case? What was the compelling reason for him to do that? Mm -hmm. So Arthur Conan Doyle, at this stage in his personal life, when this letter arrived, is actually going through a crisis. So his wife had died. His wife of several years. Uh, she died of tuberculosis. Uh, he had nursed her for thirteen years, but he has also so he, the sadness is losing his wife, but at the same time he's feeling guilty. Because while he was nursing his wife, he fell in love with another younger woman called Jean Lecky. And now that his wife has died, he can actually marry Jean, but he's feeling guilty that was he waiting for his wife to die? You know, he's having all these thoughts in his head, very dark thoughts. And um, he says, I'm not going to marry for a year. So he gives himself a year. And that's when this letter comes. <laughs> and suddenly there is something to do, you know, stand up for the underdog fight for justice and he just jumps into it and he writes in his memoirs that the George Italji case saved him in those days just working on it um, and of course let's not forget who Arthur Conan Doyle is he is part of the establishment you know in his books uh, sort of sign of four and things Indians don't come out very well they're very much in the you know Kipling perspective they are like Agra treasure, they're bandits, they're looting, they're in Andaman Islands, they're like you know Tonga it's like they're, they're pretty uh, sort of, you know, brutish characters as portrayed in his books. Um, but the thing with him being an imperialist also is that, you know, they see the British Empire as this force 
that is bringing justice, democracy, civilization to the world. So he takes this on. That you and know, how does this go about? I mean, because of justice. Yeah, yeah, he's he's, he's part of the same breed, as they say, defending <laughs> one of these uh, outliers. And yes. how is his re relationship with, let's say, the Home Office and the police, and how does it go on? Would you like to take us through that briefly? Yeah, well, that's what I discovered is <laughs> this wall that he faces because the establishment just closes its doors, and the battle is with the police. So the new material I found in the police files is very exciting. It's this whole fight between Anson, this racist police chief, and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Because Anson is so angry that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle is investigating this case that he sets out to you know, derail him at every step. He says, I'm not going to be taught policing by a writer of crime fiction. It's a huge ego thing for him. <laughs> And he just, he actually sets up false trails. So the book, I won't go into it, but the book is full of all these things that, you know, he is leading him down a false path, standing back and watching so that he can just discredit Arthur Conan Doyle to the home office. It's, um, some of it is hilarious. It's these two establishment figures in their own way, you know, clashing over George Adalji. And um, <laughs> George and is... Was, and what was the role of the home office? Because at the end, I think the appeals were being made to the home office for yeah. his so, so, yeah. How, so if we want to, yeah. yeah. Do you want to bring up the photo of Arthur Conan Doyle? And yeah. then I'll. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So uh, the one before this is so Edalji himself, he also writes his own story. As you can see, was he innocent? These are ads in the papers. And um, Arthur Conan Doyle, do we have an image of him? I think we do. Yes. Yeah. yes so here he is. And now when Arthur Conan Doyle, he actually really jumps into this investigation. So he goes to the site of the crime. He goes to Great Worley. He meets uh, Shapurji. He meets Charlotte. He walks in this field. And as you pointed out, uh, Shumit, earlier, he was myopic, wasn't he? He walks right. in this forest, in this field, and he says there is no way somebody who is myopic would have walked in this field in the dark and slashed cattle. And he, at this stage, he doesn't know that he's myopic, but um, he comes to know he's myopic uh, with their very first meeting. So I'll tell you about the first meeting they have. Uh, he sets up an appointment and he's going to meet George Adalji in a hotel in uh, near Trafalgar Square, Charing Cross Hotel. And um, uh, Conan Doyle is a bit late. He comes in a little late and um, he stands near the door and he observes. He's very much like his Sherlock Holmes, his own detective. He wants to observe a few points, or like Peluda, shall we say. <laughs> you know, if I may say it in Bengali, you know, Protomete, he has to make some a few uh, observations. Observations. <laughs> yes. So the observations are he notices that um, George Italji is sitting there and holding this newspaper very close to his face. And he says, he's obviously myopic, he's astigmatic. And I have walked on those fields. I know that, you know, this man could not have crossed dark fields at night and slayed cattle. So immediately he knows that he's innocent. And then he says that I could also see why he has been targeted. It's his appearance. You know, here is the odd man out, this brown man in the village, this odd looking man. Of course, he must have done it. So immediately our <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle in his um, Sherlock Holmes mode has made these deductions and then he meets uh, George Italji and they become friends and then he starts his investigation and then he writes this piece and maybe we have an image of what he writes in the Daily Telegraph. Um, yeah, Gurudash, can you share that? Yeah. yeah so please. while we are seeing that image, uh, Shrabani, the next question is while we are talking at the turn of that century, we also have very interesting historical developments happening in the political front. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, next, uh, next image, next image, uh, yeah. yeah. So this is what he, he writes this piece in the Telegraph. It's a two part. And you can see it's across the whole paper, the case of Mr. George Adalji. And Arthur Conan Doyle does a forensic examination of every point in the trial, picks it up and he throws it out. And he says, all this evidence is flimsy. It would not stand in any court, which is absolutely true. And now the Home Office, this paper is, this article is reprinted. It's across the Atlantic in New York Times, Washington Post. It is printed all over UK, and uh, it's even noticed by Nehru. You know, Jawaharlal Nehru. He's an 18-year-old student in Harrow, Harrow School, 
and he writes to his uh, father that the, the case of George Adalji, you may have noticed it's all over the papers. There is no doubt that he was victimized because he was an Indian. So there's a lot of attention. The letters pages are full of George Adalji. Uh, you know, I, I found these letters from these uh, Bengalis who have written in, <laughs> you know, very saying, yes, there was prejudice against him. And then he signs his name. M.A. Cantab, and he has to show that he is from <laughs> Cambridge. So the letter writer, you know, establishes his authority. Good Bengali establishes that he's from Cambridge, I think, or Roop Dash or something. I, I had to quote him because it was so good. Um, so these letters to the editor just sort of flow in. And, um, and does it help the case? Does it help yeah. the case? So the Home Office now is under pressure from everywhere. So they set up a committee and they set up a committee uh, this three-man committee says that, yes, George is not guilty of uh, slashing these animals. And they, they criticize the Staffordshire police, uh, but there is a sting in the tail. They're not going to give him everything. They say, he wrote the letters, so he is guilty of writing the letters, and he's not going to get compensation. So it just explodes, because Arthur Conan Doyle says that, what does this mean? This is like, you know, you've... You, if a man is guilty, he should be punished. If the man is not guilty and he's been held, he must be compensated for the three years he's lost in prison. So he really, you know, gets into this fight. And this far, he was focused on proving that George, uh, George is innocent. Now he wants to take it a step further. You know, like part three of the book, he says, I'm going to prove who did it. So from this section, it's like the who done it. Who done it? <laughs> so we'll park it there, Shrabani, because yes, we don't... Yes, I'm not know saying who did it. <laughs> <laughs> and whether the mystery does get solved. But very interestingly, if you notice that at that point in time, we had very eminent Parsi uh, MPs, uh, starting mm -hmm. with Dadabai Naroji, who was then an MP in, in the UK then, and mm -hmm. followed, if I'm not mistaken, two other Parsi gentlemen, Sakatwala being the third. So yep. did they not reach out to their same brethren or because they were victimized because they had left the religion? What was the role that these people played? Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. or was there any role or did you find any evidence? And you said that Nehru himself had written to his father. The Parsis mm -hmm. in India were becoming a large, you know, very successful entrepreneurs setting up large, uh, you know, businesses. Uh -huh. The Tata group was setting up at the same time. What yeah. was the role of the community of the Parsi community, which was much larger then and with uh -huh. such eminent people, even in the UK? Did they come yeah. in and support what happened? Yeah, so this is the thing that really puzzled me because uh, the first MP uh, of Indian origin is Dadabhai Naroji. He is elected in 1892. And uh, so he's gone by the time, oh, you know, 1903, he's no longer there. Uh, but I found, but they'd gone to the same Elphinstone College, you know, Shapurji and Dadabhai Naroji are both from the same college in Bombay. And I was surprised that Shapurji didn't write to him uh, when all these race hate letters were coming in saying, you know, here we are, could you help us or do something, raise it in parliament or something. But he didn't. And so I feel that he had left behind his Parsi religion. He had left behind his country and, you know, he had said it is uncivilized and come to this uh, quote unquote civilized place. But having done that now, when he is the big, you know, irony is he was being victimized here. They didn't think he was civilized. Um, he didn't, didn't want to go back and ask the Parsi community for help. So when George, by the time the second Parsi, there were only three Indian MPs before independence. So first is Dadabhai Naroji, and they're all Parsi. It's incredible. So there's Dadabhai Naroji. Then there's Mancherji Bhavnagri, who is a Tory. He's a conservative MP. And he is in power in 1906. This is the time that George is in All prison. The Catholic, yeah, the, yeah, he's yeah. in prison, yeah. And um, I was just uh, amazed that they never wrote to him. I don't know why they didn't, but there is no evidence that they did. Um, then, um, so I just feel they didn't, you know, they just didn't go back to their Parsi origins. But the interesting thing is a fund was set up when Arthur Conan Doyle starts his whole, you know, campaign. A fund is set up for in case they need legal costs. Um, and that is, um, and in that, the contributors include many Parsis and Gujaratis. So the Indian community then gets into this and they start, and they contribute, which is really nice. So, <laughs> so while you say that he was, uh, you know, insinuated and you know, right from the letters and then the maiming of cattle, were there other, in your mind, suspects? And I'm sure there, were, there are suspects and there were many suspects. How was Anson's role to protect? I mean, was he out to protect the other suspects and ensure that 
it's only a dalji and point all fingers to him if you can share a little bit on that yeah well, and what was a, because i'm sure Connor doyle also came up with a lot of plausible suspects and told the police that these are the ones that need to be charged uh -huh. and we know yeah. the whole story of uh, the sharp brothers so i don't want to give it away but if you would no, like no. to touch upon it yeah so right at the beginning you know what they do is um, you ask the person the victim is there anybody you suspect right it's standard policing you you don't have to be a policeman to do these things so they asked, you know, they asked Shapuji, who do you suspect? And he, there is in the home office files I've seen, he made a list of people who might be involved. Did they look at it? Did they take any interest? No. They were convinced that this man has done it. If they just had it in their head that this is it, he's done it. And Anson is convinced. So the police chief is convinced. He doesn't go once to the vicarage and talk to this family, you know, who are under so much attack. Um, he just ignores them and he's convinced. Um, it's George. So there's, and right till the end, he keeps on. And when jo Arthur Conan Doyle enters this, his only interest then is seeing that, you know, this man is not going to show me, show me up. I'm going to show him up. So then it's just a rivalry. It's a clash between Arthur Conan Doyle and Anson. Because he's just going to say that this man, he writes, is, he calls him CD. I mean, these notes are amazing. He says, is CD mad? That's CD Conan Doyle. Is he mad? You know, things like that. He writes to the home office saying, this is rubbish. It's, it's so George. What happens? I mean, he does get a pardon and of course, no compensation. Then what happens to Mr. George Adalji and what kind of a life does he live? And for you, Shabuni, why is this story so important today? I mean, the fact <laughs> that you went back and you had it in your back burner and of course Julian Barnes had written a fiction but the fact that you went through five years of this research to put the story to the world again why was it so important to you and what is the contextual importance saying it in 2021 something that happened 100 years back yeah well first of all you know I love an Arthur Conan Doyle mystery who doesn't who doesn't like a Sherlock Holmes mystery so there is that bit you know who doesn't like a mystery set in an English village everybody does um, that was one bit. I did want to follow an adventure. It's something I've never done before. It's not, you know, I wanted to do something different. Um, that was one aspect of it, the fun aspect of it. The second aspect is obviously the really serious issue. I mean, even though Julian Barnes wrote about it, it's, um, you know, nobody really knows George Adalji. It's, it's not some, you know, it's only, I think, when you do a piece of nonfiction and you brought up something like a big biography and the name is mentioned there that people, it registers with people. And it registers, the hate registers, um, everything he's been through registers. And it's the truth. So you know that this is, you know, 100% authentic researched. There's, you know, this is all uh, evidence of this in letters and manuscripts and everything else. So I did want to bring out the real story of George Adalji. And with new material, if there was, so as soon as I got a hint of new material, I was on it. <laughs> so while Arthur Conan Doyle is on the trail of, you know, trying to solve this mystery, I was on Arthur Conan Doyle's trail saying, let's see how this man does it and what does he do and what happens. So the whole book is <laughs> looking at how, you know, this man solves this mystery. And they and become very good friends, right? Arthur Conan Doyle and George Adalji. <laughs> They did. He was very fond of him. He had great respect for him. And he invites him to his, you know, when he does marry Jean Leckie, uh, one of the guests at this wedding <laughs> is this awkward Parsi, is George Adalji. He stands there. And later, Arthur Conan Doyle he writes that he was one of those guests I was most proud of. So you can imagine George there going to this, you know, very private reception with authors, the top authors of the day, you know, Bram Stoker, Karen K. Karen K. Terum, Bram Stoker, and, and all. everybody yeah. there, the, the, you know, who's who of the literary world, the publishers of Strand Magazine and the other thing, you know, they're all there. The champagne is flowing, the oysters are flowing, and there's our awkward George Dalchi standing near a, in a corner and uh, he has a presence. So we are not going to tell our viewers today whether the mystery was at all solved because they need to pick up their copy of the book to read and see. That's right. But I think, uh, what I would like to ask you before we open up questions to the audience is that uh, what is it about these characters that you write, not just about George, about Abdul Karim, about Noor Inayat. It's, it's an interesting pattern that I see. So the first part of the last question is, what really moves you about these characters and how, how, how do you feel and how do you own them and how difficult it is for you to let them go when the book is done? And do you have any more characters and uh, you know stories up your back burner, which we all of us at Bengal Club and our guests and our members can expect in another couple of years to come? Is there something 
that Shravani is already working on? <laughs> not at the moment. I'm not working on anything. So I'm going to answer them backwards. Um, do the characters let me go? No. The answer to that is I am still with Noreen Ayat Khan. I campaigned for a memorial for her because she's very different from Joy. I mean, she's, she's a, yeah. she's a, has a special place, you know. <laughs> so she's different from George and Kareem. Um, I campaigned for a memorial for her. I campaigned for a blue plaque for her, which I unveiled last year in the middle of this, you know, COVID restrictions. But so she has been with me for so, so many years, just bringing her story out to people. Is, uh, I think that's really been <laughs> something that I have lived with now for over 15 years. And uh, there is now Books by Princess has been optioned for television. So I hope it now goes into, you know, does reaches another audience with this, you know, television adaptation. So that'll be nice. And fingers crossed that will happen. So, so that's Noor, who hasn't left me at all. <laughs> then Abdul and Victoria, well, people have been so fascinated by this story that I still go, you know, people want me to give talks. So the, the journals that are in Windsor Castle go out in, you know, museums because the Royal Palace sends them out because they're so popular. Everyone wants to see them because they're in private archives. They can only be seen when they go out to in exhibitions. So they keep sending them out. And then those museums invite me to give a talk. So I gave a talk in Kensington Palace in Victoria's room, which is very special. The room that is not open to the public normally, the room she was born in. And she lived till she was 18. And so they opened that room up and I gave a talk about it. So I keep talking about these characters. I mean, you know, I call them characters, but they are like, you know, they so much part you. of my life. They don't let me go. So you know, one very interesting part that you write in the book in the end, what you do with your niece is you actually go and you find George and Maud's grave. And so why do you do that? And what was what was your feeling when you actually went and saw that grave, which was covered in weeds? And and you did that, I think, at the end of the book. I mean, when you were finishing mm -hmm. your story. So yeah. what well, drove I've, you to that? I have done it with all my books. I For Spy Princess, for Noor, I went to Dachau. I had to see where she's executed. I had to see the concentration camp. So I did that. Uh, with Abdul Karim, I had to find his grave. Nobody knew him in Agra. I spent three days and we did find his grave <laughs> with the help of a local journalist. Um, with George, it's, it's a sort of closure in a way. I have to see where he's buried. You know, this man that I've written about so much, I have to finally go and visit him. Uh, so it wasn't a mystery finding his grave because I knew where he's buried. But when I went there, it's discovered, it's not marked. So it took me like two hours or more in this. It was the hottest heat, day. There was a heat wave on. We nearly died finding this grave. And yeah, it's in the book how we found it. But it was just covered in ivy. I had to tear off all the ivy, scrub it down. And then finally, G-E-T, and then it all G appears. And I know, my God, there he is, you know, this man. <laughs> it's a sort of closure in a way. But also I wanted to know what is written on his tombstone you know what did they write how is this man known um i won't tell you it's all there in the book <laughs> thank you so much shabani it's been a pleasure and for your sharing your time and i'm so happy that you took time off for our members of the bengal club at the time that the book has been launched uh, across the world and I, i'm sure most of our members will pick up a copy and read it and will write to you i'm sure if you're okay <laughs> we will share your uh, fan mail uh, yes so people can write yes. Uh, thank you. It's been an honor. And it's back to Shorajish for questions from the audience for you. Thank you, Shumit. That was lovely. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> yep. And I'll take questions. Um, yes, uh, there's one at the moment. And before I ask it, I'll uh, request everybody else uh, to type in their questions in the chat box if they have any. Uh, meanwhile, there's one question uh, from uh, Dr. Julie Banerjee Mehta. What she says is uh, that there was a lot of books left in the early 1900s, uh, <clears throat> which uh, showed a sort of love-hate relationship in the in love-hate Indo-British relationship, such as Dr. Uh, Conan Doyle liked uh, George Donji, but uh, the book Kim is not so uh, not so generous towards uh, Indians. And her question is: Would very would like very much to hear your views as a historian and journalist about the current contestations of racial identity and whether you think the perception mm -hmm. of color has changed in the 120 odd years and if mm -hmm. it has changed how so right well of course 
Oh, uh, you know, everything here is now just pages and pages. Forget the pandemic. You know what is uh, on our newspapers in the UK right now, and probably across, you know, across the pond in the in Atlantic as well. It is that interview, and you know everything that fell out of that interview. So it is amazing that she had to, you know, just the one point that really struck and went around the world and has caused a furore is the fact that they discussed the color of, you know, the possible color of the skin of this child, he or she, they didn't know who it would be, you know, when he or she was born. And that is like absolutely shocking that this is being done. And it was, her, her exact words were, um, there was concern. So, and conversations and what conversation, what concern, like, you know, it is mind boggling and it's had a real fallout in many ways. So it just drives home the fact that, uh, I mean, I know the African Commonwealth countries have reacted really strongly to this. And they say, you know, many are saying this is not acceptable. After all, Britain is, you know, the queen is head of the Commonwealth. This is <laughs> all black countries. So the West in the Caribbean and the African countries have shown a lot of reservation. Um, in the US, they are saying they're absolutely shocked because, you know, England used to say that is the problem in the States, but oh my God, they're saying you guys are doing this too. So it's had a lot of ramification. Um, and I think the core, the core question is that it's just not stopped. I mean, it had never stopped. I, we never thought that it isn't like that uh, Asians, it's not like the 1970s where Asian kids were called Paki in the school grounds. That's finished. That's over. But I think things have changed in a way which has now become a prejudice, you know, an underlying prejudice, an unconscious bias in many ways. And when it's all under the surface right now, and I think it needs one trigger and it just comes to this, comes to the top, you know. So the minute they are accused of racism, there's always a counter. And that comes out really strongly. And then they'll all shout and scream and say, we are not racist, you know, and that we, our voices are being silent. So the, the culture wars then become very defined. And that is something that's happening now. The, the atmosphere in the 70s, 80s was very different when you were called Paki. Now, I don't think anyone's called a Paki on the streets. All that doesn't really happen. Um, but there is, a, you know, there is that level of, intolerance that just comes to the surface when something like this happens just triggers it and that is the uncomfortable truth there aren't any more questions <coughs> excuse me but i have one myself i've read your uh, victoria and abdul and i know how closely you have uh, followed uh, historical documents uh, to write the book i haven't read this one but my question mm -hmm. was do you occasionally have to use your imagination to fill gaps uh, in the narrative, uh, in the narratives uh, that are that you write, um, I would love to, but I don't because I build my story literally from those entries, newspaper reports, diary entries, and I write it up. It's you know the narrative is there to describe it, but the source material is very much a letter or a diary entry, or even a newspaper report. So no, I'm the the thing is these diarists are so vivid. There's a scene in Victoria and Abdul where, you know, they say we're going to go on strike and she throws everything down. Well, that happened. And how do I know it happened? Because uh, her doctor, James Reed, he writes the vivid account in his diary of how this, you know, she goes, the, she says that we're going to go on strike. And then Queen Victoria just throws a tantrum and throws everything from her desk. Uh, bottles, every, there's a vivid description in his diary of everything that actually fell on this ground. You know, ink bottles, photo frames, uh, pens. Um, so all I have to do is just write that up. So I have the source material. I can build up the narrative. I mean, it's not easy because you have a lot of material and you have to, you have to, you know, find that material that lends itself to the drama, that lends itself to the narrative. Uh, but again, you'll read that description and you'll see a footnote <laughs> and it's a Reed's diary. So everything is sourced. Um, I would love to create dialogue, but I don't have the freedom to do that. I, I stick to the text. So the dialogue will be if there's a letter, you know, there's an exchange of letters that can be used as dialogue, exchange of this, that. So I use my source material to build the narrative. That's how it's, that's how it's done. <laughs> Thank you so very much for taking the time out to speak to us at such great you. length. It's been a fascinating talk, I'm sure. Many of us uh, will uh, want to buy the book, which is uh, available everywhere. And we'll certainly keep 
a copy in the library. And uh, <laughs> when you are next in Calcutta, you might want to drop down and sign it for us. Uh, oh, absolutely, are, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. It's been much. lovely being here. Thank you. Thank you, Shumit, for coming in from Addis to do this. <laughs> thank you all for inviting me. Thank you. Thank evening. you so much, Shabani. It was really a pleasure and honor. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the Bengal Club, for being here with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>